We are in the book of Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going we're gonna to get through the book of Nehemiah the next three, four, or five weeks. We'll see how long that takes. And then we're going to kind of take a detour on Wednesday nights. And um, next week is, is Passion Week, so we're, we're going to meet every night of the week. We'll, we'll Monday through Friday all the way till um, Resurrection Sunday. So we're just going to, at, at uh, 7 o'clock for one hour, um, Monday through Friday next week, we're going to be looking at the, the just the, the life, uh, the final week of Jesus uh, as as it plays out. And so um, we'll do that next week and encourage you to, to join us. It's just a, a week as we lead up to Resurrection Sunday, and, and uh, we'll, we'll do that every night next week. Um, and then when we finish Nehemiah, we're going to jump to the book of Revelation. And, um, man, there's so much going on in our world today. I figured it'd be good to get the, the cliff notes, you know, kind of the end of the story. Kind of know how this plays out. And that's, that's what we'll be doing as we go through the book of Revelation. We're going to take our time through the book of Revelation. And what I mean by that is we're, we're going we're gonna to bring in the Old Testament prophecies that relate to the, 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 the end of, end of, of time. So we're, we're going to kind of look at Daniel. We'll be looking at Ezekiel, um, Zechariah. We'll, we'll be tying all of that in as we go through the book of, of Revelation. And so I'm, I'm excited about it. I, I just, you guys, with everything going on, you guys hearing um, all of the, the craziness going on, uh, the, the trans movement, and, and then all of the... Um, uh, Nations that, that are, you've been watching Israel, there's some, uh, a, a lot of, of upheaval going on in Israel right now, uh, and, and it's the same thing we're battling with, the, the far left and, and just this whole uh, left agenda that's being pushed, not just in America, it's throughout the world right now. And so we're living in interesting days and interesting times. And, and I thought, what, what, you know, I, I kind of thought, man, it's going to be a long time before we get to the book of Revelation. So, you know, you ever want to read Cliff Notes? You want to know what the story is going to, how it's going to end before you go through the whole book? That's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to do the Cliff Notes. We're going we're gonna to jump to the end of the story and look how this all plays out. And so we'll, we'll be doing that as soon as we're done with the book of Nehemiah three, four weeks from now. So I'm um, excited about that. We are in chapter 9 of the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bible, I uh, entitled this message, Real Revival, because I think that's exactly what happens in chapter 9. It's um, a revival and what a revival should like. There's a lot of talk about revival today. A lot of people saying, you know, are, are we at the beginning of a revival? And I, 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 I pray that's the case. I pray that that's what's, what is happening in our, in our culture. But there's some signs or there's some things that happen when a real revival takes place. And I think Nehemiah chapter 9 captures that. And so we're, we're going to take a look at that here. Remember what's happened up until this point. The children of Israel, because of their disobedience and rebellion, and idolatry and just turning their back on God, they were taken into captivity for 70 years. And it was in that time where they humbled themselves. You know, they, they, they realized that what had happened was because of their own actions, not because of God's unfaithfulness, but because of their unfaithfulness. And so they're in captivity for 70 years. And Ezra leads a is Zerubbabel actually, and and that group come back in. Well, some forty thousand of them make the return, and then Ezra comes back, and then Nehemiah comes back, and so you had three waves of people that were in Babylon returning to Jerusalem, and it's incredible because, you know, Ezra come, uh, for, first, you know, they're trying to uh, build the temple, and and they they kind of lost sight of that and and they have to have be rebuked and reminded that you know that this this was their priority they rebuild the temple Ezra the priest comes and Ezra begins once again you know the the teaching of God's word he was he was someone who had a heart for God and he was um leading 
the spiritual aspect of it, but they were still under great oppression because the enemy had access to them. The walls were torn down, the, the enemy was there, infiltrated, kind of mingled with them. And so Nehemiah has it in his heart to come back and rebuild the walls. And his, he returns within 52 days, the walls are built, the gates are hung, and they meet in the open square by the water gate, and they begin to read God's word. And as they read God's word, the people are convicted they were cut to the heart and they begin to weep and we're told in in this scripture that Nehemiah the governor and Ezra there in verse 9 of chapter 8 it says and the Levites who taught the people said to the people this day is holy to the Lord your God do not mourn nor weep for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law and so they heard God's word and, and, it, and it, it cut them to the core. They, they began to mourn. They began to weep. And, and Nehemiah, as would step in, they go, look, guys, God is showing his grace right now. I mean, we should be rejoicing right now because of what God has done and what God is doing. And so he encouraged them, and they began to read God's word, and they were hungry for God's word. And as they had this hunger for God's word, we're told at the end of chapter 8, that they came across the passage that they were to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and they, you know, now begin to obey God's word for the first time in a long time where they began to actually say, you know what, if that's what God says, then that's what we need to do. And they began to do it. Guys, and, and God's word is given to us, not, not to coddle us or not not to sit there and, and try to um you know make us feel good about ourselves god's words there so that we would obey it that that's what his word was was given to us for so that you and i would know the right way so that we would know what what god's heart is what god de declares and what god desires of us and so as you take god's word and and you hear it your now response is is, is to act upon it to do those things that he's instructing us to do Right, And so they do it, and then we're told as we begin chapter 9, check this out, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles is behind them now. They, they've done their, um, their, their worship, their reading. I mean, they, God was moving in, in a very special way. And you come to chapter 9, it says, Now on the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled, watch this, with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Now, they, 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 even though they had put a break on it when it was the feast days and when God was moving, they knew that there, there was this act of repentance that needed to take place in their own lives. So they begin to fast. They were denying their physical appetites. They begin to put sackcloth on. That, that, that's, a, that's a sign of mourning. It's, 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 you know, sackcloth is itchy and uncomfortable, but it, it was this idea that, you know, we're not concerned about our physical state. We're more concerned about our spiritual state. And then it says that they began to throw dust on their head. And I, I don't know what that looks like. I, I've been in a couple of places where dust gets thrown on my head and it's never fun. <laughs> That's just <laughs> a miserable thing. You know, you're in a big windstorm and you come out and you get kind of got grit in your hair or you're on the construction site and just, you know, dust flying on you. And, you know, that, that's just, it's just a miserable um, experience to have you know someone throw sand in your face or you know dust it and, but they were doing it to themselves they were just you know throwing and it was this whole idea that man we have failed and we faltered and we wanted god to hear us and and their god to see our our heart as we're displaying it with our physical uh, uh you know appearance and our in our in our ability to come before him and it, it's amazing because, guys, I, I think this is something that only the Holy Spirit can produce in someone's life. It's not something we, we can, I don't have it in me 
to come to God and just say, God, I'm so messed up. It's only when the Holy Spirit begins to stir someone to that means, to that conclusion in their life, where you just, you, you realize, man, I, I have failed. I failed as a father. I failed as a husband. I failed, you know, as, as a servant of the Lord. I, I failed in, in, you know, so many arenas. And you come and you just like, I, God, I, I, I just confess. And that's what's taking place in Israel. They were coming before the Lord in humility. They humbled themselves before God. And as they did so, watch what it says in verse 2. Then those Israelite lineage, those of Israelite lineage, separated themselves from all the foreigners. Now, this, this wasn't some racial thing. This was a spiritual thing. Because they had mingled with all the foreigners. They had also mingled with all of the idolatry. And, and, and they had... And, and, and truly, that, that's, that's the... The heart of someone, those that are going to be in opposition to what God desires anymore. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he says, come out from among them. Be separate. Be holy. And that's what is transpiring in the nation of Israel. They're saying, you know what? No, no longer are we going to live a compromised life. We're not going to live a, 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 a life where we're, we're just allowing the enemy and the enemies of God to influence any longer. We're going to separate ourselves. Notice what he says next there. And they confess their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. In other words, what they did is they came before the Lord and they acknowledged we're wrong, God. What we've been doing is wrong. What our forefathers had done was wrong. And we no longer want to live in that state any longer. We want to, we want to do what's right in your eyes. Guys, that's true revival. It, it, it's, it's when we come and we humble ourselves before the Lord and we acknowledge, God, I, I messed up. I can't do this without you. And then we, we confess to him and we acknowledge our iniquities. And we're not relying upon, well, that's how dad did it and that's how grandma did it and that's how great grandma did it. And, you know, we, we have this idea of tradition that somehow being, you know, following what they did somehow is right. And they're just acknowledging our, our dad and our mom and our grandma, they were wrong. And so we're not going to do what they said. We're going to do what you said. We're going to do what God declares. Because, you know, if I'm wrong, I hope my kids don't follow on my path, <laughs> right? And, and, and if, if, I'm, if I'm doing what's right, I hope my kids follow that example. And so they, they acknowledge our, our fathers, our forefathers, they failed. That, that takes a certain amount of humility to acknowledge. And, and they, they had brought that before the Lord. And then verse 4, we're told, then Jeshua and all of his buddies stood on the stairs <laughs> of the Levites and they cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites and all their buddies said, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. That's the third time that they're told to stand up. Remember back in verse 2, it says the foreigners, they, and, uh, they separated themselves from the foreigners and they stood and they confessed their sins. And then in verse chapter 3, verse, uh, the beginning of chapter, verse 3, I'm sorry, they stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law. Did I skip that whole verse? I did. Verse 3, how did I do that? Okay, verse 3. They stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for one fourth of the day and for another fourth they confess, confess and they worship the Lord, their God. And, and think, think about what's happening. They confess their sins. They acknowledge that, the, that their forefathers, their fathers were wrong. But what did they do? They went straight to God's word to find out what was right. And the only way you're going to know what right is, is if, you, if, if you go to God's word to discover that. It, it, this isn't about tradition or 
or you know what others have done what does God say and and they, they opened up the word of God and for a fourth of the day that would have been about a three hour span a fourth of the day we don't know if it was the first fourth from six in the morning till nine. We don't know from nine to noon, but for a fourth of the day, they just heard God's word being read to them. You guys think an hour service is long. You ain't seen nothing. Right? Three, three hours just reading God's word. And then for the next three hours, the another fourth of the day, they worshiped the Lord. That was a three hour worship service that took place. Back to back. And for six hours, they're standing and they're confessing and they're hearing and they're worshiping the Lord. And they devoted, committed, you know, that, that day to, to, to hearing what God would say to them. And they, at this point, it says, the command was stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And he, again, you know, like we've been standing, well, stand some more, <laughs> Stand up. And how, how important it is that you and I in the culture that we're living in stand up. And confess and stand up and worship and stand up and seek the heart of God and the word of God for our lives and for the lives of our children. That we're making a stand. And, and it, it, it's, it's amazing that this next section of scripture is recalling God's faithfulness. And he's going to give us a history lesson here. He's going to take us back through creation, the book of Genesis. He's going to take us to the book of Exodus. We're going to look at the book of Deuteronomy. Just in this prayer, it's a prayer. It's the longest prayer in the Bible. And it's recorded for us. And this prayer is, is, is an incredible prayer because as he's praying, he's recalling who God is and who we are. And I, I think prayer incorporates both of those. It's reminding us who God is when we're praying. Remember how Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, holy be thy name. And well, that, that's recalling who God is, who we're addressing in, in, in that prayer. He's going to take a little bit longer to address who God is in this prayer. Look what he says in verse 5 there, middle of it. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. And he again, opens up this prayer with, with, you know, blessing God, blessing his glorious name. And, and they, you don't even address him by his name. It's just, you know, your glorious name, God. You, you are beyond description. You're glorious in who you are. I like what he says, you're exalted above all blessing and praise. That, that you're, you're above anything we can ever bring to you. You're, you're, you're higher than any blessing or any praise that we can offer to you. And then, check this out, look at verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, which with all of their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. If that doesn't describe God for you, I don't know what does. Creator of everything. Everything that exists worships him. All the host of heaven, everything that, you know, that is. And he says there, and God, you created all of it. And he takes us through the book of Genesis, the opening parts of the book of Genesis, that is. And reminds us that, that God is the creator of heaven and earth. That, that everything that is, 
is because he created it. Heaven and earth is all because of him. It's all for him. And not only did he create it all, he preserved it all. He preserves them all. And it all being held together by his hand. And if God ever let it go, we, we, would, we would just explode into nothingness. God holds it together. From the beginning of time to the very end of it all, he holds it all together. There's coming a day, and Peter tells us about it, when it's all going to melt with a fervent heat. It's all going it's all to dissolve. When he, when he finally brings it to its conclusion. And as he's praying this prayer, he remember, he was, we're, we're, he's reminding those that were in that prayer service of God's beginning, or not God's beginning, but of our beginning. God always was. We came into being when God created and then look at verse 7. Man, I love this. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You see, it was God's choosing of Abram. Abram was, what well, he wasn't a Jew. He, he wasn't the, the, the father of the Jews. He was just another heathen in Ur. An idolater. And God pulled him out of the idolatry and made him the father of faith. God chose him from the foundations of the world. Here, here's the man that God was going to, you know, fulfill his promises through. God's choosing. And it's an incredible, it's an incredible thought because it was Abraham who now is going to be the founder of the Jewish faith. And he's going to be the father of faith to all of us as he obeys God, as he follows God. Hebrews tells us that he followed God not knowing where he was going. You know, just God spoke to him and he said, Lord, whatever you say, I'm in. And he begins to wander in what would become the promised land. He learns to walk with God by faith. God had promised him that through his seed, the descendants of all, you know, his descendants would, would be as the, as the stars of, of the sky and, and is, is, is many in multitude as the sands of the seashore. And Abraham didn't even have a son until he was 100 years old. I, that just boggles my mind. Sarah, 90 years old. And he had to learn faith. You, you see, he, he tried to do it in his own power. He ended up with Ishmael. And his, one of his low moments is it was a lack of faith. But God was teaching him to walk by faith. And then, you know, at 100 years old, he has this, this little boy who turns into a grown man. And then God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and offer him to me. And Abraham says, Lord... If that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. Puts the, the wood on Isaac's back, carries him up to the tree, uh, up the mountain. And, and w w what's incredible, it becomes a type of Christ that would come and redeem the world. And he's ready to plunge that knife into his, his only son. God stops him. And provides for him a lamb. And Abraham declares, God will provide himself a sacrifice. 
And it was all pointing us to Christ and to what he would accomplish on our behalf. And Abraham, you know, was counted as a faithful man. Look what it says in verse eight. You found his heart faithful before you. And I love, I love that. You know, we find out what God saw in Abraham. He was a faithful man. It was God's choosing, but he was a faithful man. And God's always looking for faithful men, faithful women. I love the passage in 2 Chronicles 69 where God says, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God wants to show his power, his might. He's looking for the loyal heart. And his eyes go to and fro through the whole earth, you know, searching, seeking for that loyal heart. And Abraham was found, <laughs> chosen. And you are told in verse 8 there, and he made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jubasites, and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. You see, God made a covenant with Abraham. This promise that, that his descendants would one day occupy the land that he was wandering in. And just like God declared, God did. Because God's faithful. He fulfilled the covenant. He performed his word. And He's declared as righteous because of it. You know, and, and that, that whole idea of being just and being able to, to do what it is he declared he would do, you know, that, that, that's what the prayer is, is, is de declaring, right? That God did what he promised he would do, and he always does, because that's who he is. You're righteous. You did for Abraham, which you declared you would do. And then I love verse 9, man. Watch this. And he's going to pull in now to the book of Exodus. <laughs> you saw the afflictions of our fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all of his servants, against all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself as it is this day. And we're reminded of God delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt. The hand of Moses the miracles that, that God performed, the plagues that came upon the Egyptians. And, and God, looking down from heaven, you know, is able to bring his judgment upon those that were persecuting the Israelites. Ten plagues. And, and, and all of them dramatic, you know, all, all of it, you know, overwhelming, you know, frogs and fleas and you know you, it, you know just just unbelievable plagues that would come upon the land and the Egyptians would experience it but the Israelites just around the corner were spared of it because God is faithful and God hears the cries of his people God's able to intervene in difficult circumstances and situations and it's amazing because as, as he as he you know brings all of these things to light here you know you, you realize that the character of God that was uh, then is also the same character of God now God is the same yesterday today forever he's able to intervene he's able to 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 deliver I like what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 12. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
And we look around and, and you think, well, it sure seems like evil's prevailing right now. It sure it seems like, like the, the, those who are opposing God are, are being very successful at doing so. Oh, they got their moment, but understand something, their day is coming. Their day is coming. That when you rebel against God, you lose. I like how Proverbs, Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God sees it all. And we're reminded here in, in verses 9 and 10 that, that God saw it all. He saw the afflictions of those that were in Egypt. He was able to deliver from those afflictions with the plagues that had come upon them and then eventually letting them go out to worship God. And then look at verse 11. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land and their per persecutors you threw into the deep. And he reminds how they were cornered. Do you remember, remember the story? Charlton Heston was right there. No, that's not it. <laughs> they, were, they were backed up against the Red Sea and, and, and behind them there's the Egyptian army and there's a big wall between them because God was protecting them. And then Moses opens, sticks his staff out and he parts the land and they walk across on dry land. Unheard of. You know, it's something that, it, that doesn't even make logical sense. Except God. And they walk across on dry land. I'm sure they got a couple little fish on the way. Food for the other side, I guess. But then the enemies come in thinking they're going to cross on the dry land. And God allows the Red Sea to come back and drowns the enemies of God. And they're recalling God's faithfulness. Guys, can I tell you something, man? It's important to go back and recall God's faithfulness in your own life. I, I look back and I, I just see God's hand in so many different moments in my life. And, and, you know, you just sit back and go, God, you've been so faithful. You've been so good. I, I should have died in this moment. I, sh I, sh I, sh I should have OD'd at this place. I mean, you know, I, I can look back on my life and, and see God's grace on display over and over and over again. And when, when I'm reminded of that, I, 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 I'm, I'm encouraged. I remember, you know what, God, God, he's always been faithful. He's always got me through every circumstance and it gives me just that little bit of faith to endure the next one. And I think that's exactly what's going on with the children of Israel. They're going back and saying, God, you've done it over and over again. You've been faithful over and over again. Even, and watch as he continues. I'm going to get too far ahead. Watch what he says. Verse 12. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai. You spoke with them from heaven and you gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And here, here, here's, here's what... They're recalling as they were in now the outskirts of the promised land, God every day would lead them with a cloud every day. And when night fell and they were still traveling, there was a, there was a light there to guide them by night, to light up the road, to give them the direction and which, which way to go. And God led them every day to where they were to be. And not only did he lead them, he took them to Mount Sinai. And at, there in Mount Sinai, Moses went up on the mountain and he was given God's law. The commandments. And I, I like what he says, they were just ordinances and true laws. 
He showed us how we're to live. He showed us, you know, how we're to apply those truths to our own lives. God, you gave us instructions. No other nation possessed that. No one else had truth delivered to them from heaven. And so God had given them all all of the the truths that they needed to, to be successful. Not, not just the commandments, but, you know, you go through the book of, you know, Deuteronomy, you go through the book of, um, you know, Exodus, and, and God had given them instructions and what the law was to look like, told them the difference between, in, you know, voluntary, you know, manslaughter and, and, and you know, involuntary. He gave them instructions on how they were, they were to govern and how they were to live and, and how they were to handle circumstances and situations, the, the truths of of the law were all provided to them as God was establishing for himself his people. And he's just, he's just going back and he said, man, God, God, you did all. He, look, look what he says in verse 14. You made known to them your holy Sabbath, commanded them precepts, statutes, laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. You told them to go and to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. And so God not only gave them the laws and the truths and the statutes and the precepts, but he provided for them the food. You can go back and we're told that they would get one homer a day for every family, for every person in the family, every person in Israel. That, that, that's about, well, it's two million people. One homer is about six pints. It's somewhere around 12 million pints, which would have been about 45,000 tons of bread provided from heaven every day. I mean, that, that's just mind-boggling. You just kind of wake up in the morning and there's 45,000 tons out there waiting for you to go pick up. Every day. God provided. Out of the rock, all of the water, they would, they would need about 11 million gallons of water a day in the wilderness. Can, can you imagine the logistics of that? You know, we, we, we have a, a, a conference and we feed, you know, five, six hundred, seven hundred people. And it's just like nerve wracking. You know, and, and you think there's two million people every day being fed. And they didn't go a day without a meal. God provided all the water necessary. That, that, that was just their drinking water. And just, you know, just that wasn't showering. And, you know, I wonder how many gallons of water a day were, were necessary to, you know, care for six or for two million people. It's, it's unbelievable. But God was faithful. I, I, I like, like what it says there in, in verse. The end of verse 15. And you told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. And, and God says look. You would think. I, I, I don't know. About you, you, you would think. After for 40 years watching God provide every step of the way, you would think, man, there's nothing God can do, but they're still afraid of little 10-foot giants. You're just like, what's a 10-foot giant after you've been living in the wilderness for 40 years and every day you got food waiting for you? But they did. Matter of fact, we're told in verse 16, look look at verse 16. But they and our fathers acted proudly. They hardened their necks. They did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey. They were not mindful of your wonders. And you know, that just is hard to fathom. If you're the one who saw the plagues come upon the Egyptians... The angel of death pass over every household and the oldest son in the house would die and your house, nothing happened to you. And, you know, you, the, the, all of the 
hail and, and you know, everything that happened, fire coming down. From, and you would think that after watching all of that, you would go, man, I'm all in. Can I tell you something? Miracles will never make you believe. If miracles would make you believe, the, these guys should be the most believing people on the face of the earth. <laughs> 40 years provided for them, you know, manna, water. They even got one big meal of quail till it was coming out of their ears, right? And you, you would think after all of that, that they would have this tremendous amount of faith because I know who God is and what God's able to do, but they still were rebellious, hardened their necks, did not obey their commandments. They refused to obey and they were not, and they were not mindful, watch this, of your wonders. Because even though they saw all of that, they, they, didn't, they didn't obey. Guys, I, I think there, there's, there was times in my life where I say, God, if you would just come and talk to me, then I would believe. If you would just show up, then I, and the reality is, is that you could experience all of that and still not believe. That's the children of Israel. But check this out. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage, the rebellion against Moses. And they say, you know what, let's, let's find someone who was better in Egypt. At least we had leaks. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You were in bondage. You were in slavery. You were getting whipped every day. But we had leaks. Those were good leaks, right? <laughs> In the middle of all of that, they, they, they wanted to go back to Egypt. After experiencing all that, after seeing God's hand, after all of God's provisions and God's protection, and they, they, were, they were saying, you know what, we were better off in Egypt. And then watch this, look, look and verse, end of verse 17, middle of verse 17, it says, but you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness and did not forsake them, even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt and worked great provocations, yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. Wow. Guys, the character of God. Even when they did all of those vile, horrible things, it didn't change the character of God. He was gracious to pardon, or I'm sorry, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful. Interesting. In the book of Exodus, chapter 33, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to turn there real quick because this particular incident that is being referenced happened right after the children of Israel had made a golden calf. And beginning in verse 11 of chapter 33, watch this, and we, we, we'll, we'll just kind of skim it, but watch, watch what it says. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. And Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you said, I know you by name, and you have found Grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you, that I might find grace in your sight and consider this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here for how will how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us, so we shall be separate, your people 
and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing which you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. He said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim I'm sorry, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion to whom I will have compassion. And he said, I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. I'm sorry, that, that, I skipped the whole verse there. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Check this out. I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll have compassion and I'll have compassion. He said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face and live. So the Lord said, here's a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. And it will be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face you shall not be, shall not be seen. Chapter 34. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first one. And I will write on these tablets, the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. So be ready in the morning. Come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. And no one shall come with you. Let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flock nor herd feed before the mountain. He cut the tablets of stone like the first ones. And Moses rose early in the morning. He went to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud. And he stood with them there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, yet visiting the iniquity of the father upon the children, children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and he bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped, check this out, and he said, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Isn't that cool? Because what, what, what you have here is, is you got a people that have failed, faltered, and yet God's so gracious and so merciful. And the enemy is always there to make us feel like we're so, you know, unworthy. We failed so many times. Go, you know, why would you even go back to God? You, you're just, you know, so unfit. And yet God's the God of mercy and grace. He's there longing for us to come back to him. Long-suffering, kind, patient. He didn't turn his back on them. He, God, God he was still there to pardon them, to forgive them, to wash them, because that's who he is. And I'm so grateful that's who he is. He sees our stiff neck rebellious hearts and he's there waiting he's waiting for us to just to say God I, I can't do this unless you're with me I don't want to go nowhere unless you're there by my side in my own ability I'll fail you every time but with you God I can have great success at the end of going back to Nehemiah chapter 9 there in verse 19 he says your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness watch this the pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way that they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not withhold your manna from your mouth. 
From their mouth, you gave them water for their thirst. Forty years, you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Wow. In spite of their rebellion, in spite of their idolatry, God still showed mercy and grace. The same God that loves you. The same merciful, gracious, long-suffering God. And you have a better covenant than they had. You have the blood of Jesus that cleanses you. And the enemy still, the same tactics, you know, you, why even try? Look how many times you fail. I, I know what you did last week and last year and last month and last night. And the enemy is there to, to make you so shameful and so unworthy, condemned, that you never even... Surrender it all to him. Condemnation pushes you away from God. God didn't come to condemn you. He he came to rescue you, to save you. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is, is, is God's gift to us. You should be convicted. You should feel horrible when you fail, when you fall. Through. But that should cause you to run to the cross. Embrace the grace of God and the love of God and acknowledge God. I can't, I can't, even, I can't even be a minute without you. If I'm without you for a second, I blow it. God, I need, I need you every moment of every day. Because without you, I can't do anything. And it should cause us to run to him. And I, 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 love, I love the end of verse 21. We'll wrap it up here. It, it's there. Verse, we'll pick up in verse 22 next week. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Forty years. The same clothes. Man, I, I wish that was happening when my kids were young. <laughs> you know how many shoes I bought? They'd outgrown like every month, you know. <laughs> like, man, I wish their shoes didn't wear out. I'd... Every need that they possessed, God was able to take care of. As good as after 40 years, the styles kind of come back anyway. So they, they, they were in fashion by the time they got to the promised land. Like, those are nice shoes. Yeah. You see, guys, God is faithful. He's faithful in every circumstance, in every situation. He's just looking for those who are willing to yield themselves to him. Just to say, God, I, I can't, can't do this without you. If you realize that you're like the children of Israel, then all you've done was come to reality. <laughs> Stiff-necked, rebellious. All you did was, was, was acknowledge truth. Because that's I and you. And God is gracious and merciful and long-suffering. He's waiting with open arms for you to just embrace his grace and his love. If the enemy the enemy's been there condemning you, and you know, man, let me tell you something, man. God loves you with an everlasting love. And he's not there condemning you.
He's drawn you to him. That's his heart. 